Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so excited to have you join us today. My name is Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action. And on behalf of the entire staff of Consumer Action, I would like to welcome you. I am so excited. I am pumped about the conversation we get to have today about understanding the role of data networks and fintech. Did you know that millions of consumers of all income levels use fintech tools on mobile phones and computers to monitor and manage their finances and conduct financial transactions? Do you know what data networks do? Do you know if the policy landscape around the use of fintech is, is evolving? And as fintech continues to grow, are regulators likely to step in and require greater transparency and control for consumers? As community leaders, you need to know to answer these questions, and you are in the right place today. Today, we have three subject matter experts who will answer these questions and more. With us today is Ben White with Plaid, Sean Cram with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and Daniel Dan Murphy, Policy Manager with Health Net with the Financial Health Network. So buckle up and get ready for three outstanding presentations. Now, before I get too excited, I need to go over a few housekeeping items with you. As the announcer stated, you are in listen-only mode, but you can use the question function on the right of your screen to type in your questions. We love hearing from you. So at the end of the presentation, Outreach Trainer Nelson Santiago, he's gonna facilitate the question and answer segment. This is where we want to hear from you. So please take a minute, find a question function so you can send Nelson a ton of questions. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available to you along with the PowerPoint slides used today in a few handouts, no later than tomorrow afternoon. And this is real important. At the end of the training, you will receive a survey about today's webinar. We value your feedback as we work diligently to improve our service to you. So if you have a comment, a suggestion, or even a compliment, we would love to hear from you. So please complete the survey. And as a bonus for attending today, you will receive a certificate of completion. Now, before I go any further, I need to take a moment to thank our sponsor and to update you on what's happening at uh, Consumer Action. The webinar is being presented with funding from Plaid. And on behalf of the entire staff at Consumer Action, I would like to thank Plaid for this opportunity. Now to update you on what's happening uh, at Consumer Action. We are turning 50. Yep, Consumer Action has been around slaying for 50 years. We are celebrating the big 5-0 on November the 16th with a virtual change maker convening with national syndicated personal finance guru, columnist of the Washington Post and author of What to Do with Money When a Crisis Hit, Miss Michelle Singletary. It is going to be a blast, so help us celebrate. Please go to our website and register to join us on our very special day. Now, if you don't know, at Consumer Action, we publish educational materials in multiple languages. Our latest fact sheets are on understanding the data networks, which help you connect your bank accounts to FinTech apps, and how data networks help you manage your financial data. Both fact sheets are relevant, they are complete. You can download them now and conduct the training using the materials without adding anything. So please go to our website and download both fact sheets. Now, before I go any further, I would like to lay a foundation for you, if, if I may, by going over a few terms you're likely to hear uh, more than once today. I'm certain you will hear the term financial technology or a FinTech for short. As is stated on the screen, FinTech refers to the use of modern technology, such as the internet and mobile apps to develop powerful financial services too for consumers and businesses. Data sharing is another term that you would hear more than once a day. Many FinTech apps rely on consumers consenting to share their financial information, meaning they share the data from their bank and of the traditional financial services account with their chosen app so that the app can work. Our guest speakers will get a little more in the weeds about data sharing doing their presentations. Data networks is another word that you hear a lot today. As indicated on the screen, data networks are companies that help consumers connect their chosen FinTech app to their financial services. I think you get the picture, so let's move on to the agenda. This is where we're headed today. 
At Consumer Action, we believe in making learning fun. So we open up every training by testing your knowledge on the topic of the training with our most popular game, How Much Do You Know? Today, we have three true or false questions on understanding the role of data networks. Following the game, I will introduce you to our guest speakers in the order that they will be presenting. A question and answer se segment led, led by Nelson Santiago will follow. I will come back, tell you how to donate to consumer action and wrap up. So let's get started with the game. This is how the game is played. We have three questions. All are either true or false and related to today's topic. I will read the question. You will use the question function to answer that question. After we close the poll, I will tell you if the question is true or false and why. At the end of the game, the person with the most correct answers get to walk away with the bragging rights to the how much you know game. So let's roll out the first question. Are you ready to go? True or false? FinTech refers to any technology that is used to digitize, streamline, or enhance financial services. Is that true or is that false? FinTech refers to any technology that is used to digitize, streamline, or enhance financial services. A couple more seconds. Let's close the poll and look at the result. 94% of you says it's true. 6% says it's false. 94% you've been listening because that is absolutely true. Trintech, fin, there are fintech tools for viewing and managing your financial accounts, sending and receiving money, paying bills, tracking and analyzing your spending, creating and updating a budget and working towards your financial goals. So that is absolutely true. Let's move on to the next question. Data networks are companies that help consumers connect their FinTech apps to their financial accounts. Is that true or is that false? Data networks are companies that help consumers connect their FinTech apps to their financial accounts. Is that true or false? A couple more seconds. Don't overthink it. Okay, let's close the poll. Take, take a look at the result. Wow, 72% of you think that is true? And only 28% of you think that's false? With 72%, you are correct. That is true. Data networks facilitate the behind the scenes handshake that enable an app to access the financial account data needed to do what it is designed to do. For an example, it enables a peer-to-peer -peer payment app to request money from your checking account and send it over to your friend's account to pay for your share of the dinner. You're doing great. You're doing really well. Let's move on to the next question. Trusted data networks use APIs, which not only keep login credentials private, but also may allow consumers to limit the data they share. Is that true or is that false? Trusted data networks use APIs, which not only keep login credentials private, but also may allow consumers to limit the data they share. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. Okay, let's close the poll and take a look at the results. Wow, 81% of you think that's true. And only 19% of you think it's false. 81%, you're correct, it is true. All of the questions were true today. And API is another term I think you're gonna hear a lot today. An API is an application programming interface. It is a dedicated interface that allows you to share your financial account data with an app without having to share your account login credentials. An API not only keep your login credentials private, it also allows you to control what data is shared and for how long. Now, for more information about data sharing and control, Remember those fact sheets I talked about earlier? Go to our website and download, uh, download those fact sheets. Now, are you fired up and ready for our feature presentation? Our first speaker today is Ben White. Ben leads research and advocacy in North America on the policy team at Plaid, a financial data connectivity platform that enables consumers to access and share their financial data to power their favorite fintech tool. 
Ben previously worked at the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program, where he researched fintech and financial inclusion, consumer debt, and retirement savings. Prior to Aspen, Ben was the head of the business development on with Financial, a fintech employer-based financial platform. Welcome to the webinar, Ben. Following, following Ben, we have Sean Crean. He is a senior fintech risk and policy advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. Ben is the fintech team lead for financial help and inclusion at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. He heads efforts to embed financial help as a principle in the Fed's assessment of new technology. During the COVID-19 crisis, he led a team of economists, bank supervisors, and community development specialists that innovated policy support for small businesses. Ben previously worked as an economist with the San Francisco Fed Country Analysis Unit, where he researched innovative use of policy and technology to build inclusive financial systems in Asia. Ben also worked, John also worked as an advisor to the San Francisco uh, Fed Management Committee. Before joining the Fed, Sean worked as a management consultant to companies operating and investing in Asia. Welcome to the webinar, Sean. Our last speaker is uh, Daniel Dan Murphy. He is a policy manager at FinTech Health Networks. As a manager on the program team in the Financial Health Networks Washington DC office, Dan focuses on policy and leads the Financial Health Networks work on consumer data rights. Dan is interested in, in, the, in the intersection of competition policy, data governance, and financial regulation. He believes in working towards an economic system that allows consumers to live financially healthy lives. Prior to joining the Financial Health Network, Dan worked on FinTech policy at the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets. He also worked at the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee and the World Bank. Welcome to the webinar, Dan. Let me now turn the uh, program over to our first speaker, uh, Ben White uh, from Platt. Uh, ben, you have control of the board. Well, thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for bringing that amazing energy to this session. I am also energized to share with this incredible group um, a lot of interesting knowledge and hopefully useful information for you all to take back and share with your communities and your constituents on the role of data networks. Oh, sorry about that. So my name is Ben White. As Linda said, I work on policy research and advocacy at Plaid. If you haven't heard of Plaid before, you're going to learn a lot today. Today's topic is the role of data networks in fintech. You've probably heard the word fintech pop up a lot over the past year, whether in the news or on billboards or even at your bank. Data networks, however, might be newer to you, and I'm excited to share more with you about data networks today. We're hosting this webinar with Consumer Action to educate community organizations and consumers who use fintech on how they could take advantage of the innovative products and services available to them while maintaining their privacy and security on the internet. Data networks have an important role to play in this system, so it's critical for consumers to know what we do. To quickly run through our agenda, I'm going to start with a high-level perspective on what fintech is and share some data from a recent survey Plaid ran of US consumers on how they use fintech and how it affects their financial lives. Then I'll go into some detail on the role your data plays in fintech and why that matters. I'll talk about how the roles in the financial ecosystem have changed due to fintech and why it is that data networks exist. Then I'll talk about what exactly it is that data networks do and how you can control your financial data using data networks. Finally, I'll share more on how Plaid and other data networks ensure your privacy and security while you're using fintech. We're in an exciting moment right now in financial services, one where more options than ever are available to consumers. Where it was once the case that you might only be able to get financial services from the bank down the street, the internet, innovation, and data has made it possible for everyday consumers to have more options and to find experiences 
that could be a better fit for their day-to-day -day and long-term financial lives. Plaid is a company that works in the fintech space, and I promise I'll share more about what we do in just a second, but I wa we wanted to understand how consumers use fintech and what impact it has on their financial lives. So we ran a report for the past two years called the Fintech Effect, where we surveyed 2,000 consumers in the US and asked a series of questions on their fintech use. Here are just some of those findings. For starters, around 90% of people we surveyed said they use fintech of one kind or another, including their online banking applications. 80% of people said they could manage their entire financial lives online and don't need to visit a bank branch at all. That's not to say that they won't, because let's admit it, a human touch never goes out of style. But it shows just how much people get done with their finances online. Finally, because there are so many applications out there and they help people with so many tasks, people said on average they have three or more FinTech applications on their phones. So why do people use FinTech? We asked and people said it's because they get more control over their finances. FinTech's first major innovation was helping people see all their financial accounts in one place. And as hard as it is to manage money, FinTech can really help by putting people in greater control. A similar number of people said fintech fits seamlessly into their daily lives. This is where technology makes our lives more convenient. Rather than getting in the car to go to the ATM to pay back a friend for lunch, we can use applications like Venmo to send money directly to them. Overall, around three in four US consumers said fintech actually empowers them, which is huge for consumers in an industry like financial services where things get confusing fast. This is where data becomes important. Because FinTech relies on consumers connecting their accounts, 83% of people say that when they use FinTech, they prefer to choose where they share their financial data instead of having companies share their data for them. Similarly, around three in four consumers said that they value the ability to share their financial information with the applications they want to use. And seven in 10 said they feel comfortable sharing data when they use financial technology. This has made data sharing an important part of people's financial lives. Three quarters of the US respondents to our survey said that when choosing a bank, they consider it a top priority, the ability to connect their accounts to apps and services. 70% or 69% said that they would even consider switching banks if they couldn't connect their accounts to FinTech. And a similar number call it out as an important consideration overall in their financial lives. So how exactly has FinTech changed the structure of our financial system? And how does this system fit together now? Well, this visual shows just how different today's world is. Before FinTech, financial relationships took place between a single consumer and a single provider. We would walk down the street to your bank and they'd give you an account and a checkbook. Now consumers engage with a number of financial institutions and also a number of non-bank financial providers like fintechs. But because consumers have many accounts across this system, data networks like Plaid came forward to help the ecosystem work better together. You might think of this as a shift from a two-party to a four-party ecosystem. So how do data networks work? They help you connect your financial accounts into digital finance. Plaid has connected over 5,000 fintech applications to over 11,000 financial institutions today and has helped millions of Americans connect to digital finance. Plaid is also regulated under federal and international law as a company operating in the finance and technology space. The reason data networks are necessary is that with 11,000 financial institutions and 5,000 applications in the United States, it takes a lot of technical work for a single fintech provider to plug into all 11,000 of those banks. So Plaid takes on that responsibility itself as a data network and becomes a single point of technology integration that consumers can use to connect from any financial institution to any fintech they want. This functionally levels the playing field because whether you bank with a major financial institution or a small credit union, either way, because of Plaid, you get to use Venmo. Let's take things a step deeper, or five steps, I should say. Here's a visual with those four parties who now come together in digital finance. There's you, the consumer, at the top. You have a relationship with your bank, with a fintech, 
and with a data network. Step one is you have a bank account. This could be with a bank or a credit union or even a fintech like Chime. Step two is that financial institution connects via a data network to the digital finance ecosystem. Sometimes the data network has a formal agreement with your bank. Sometimes they don't. But generally, the data network is responsible for building that connection. Step three, when you want to get a new financial product, maybe you go to the internet or the app store and find one that works for you. That application will need to connect to your account at the financial institution. So they'll send you to the data network while you're signing up. And you'll authorize that data network to establish a secure connection between your bank and that FinTech application where only the types of data you want to share will be sent. For example, if you're using a budgeting tool to track your spending, you'll share just your recent transactions with that FinTech. Or if you're using a payments tool to pay back your friends, you can share just your account information, just like writing a check. Or if you're looking to get into investing and want to see your net worth, you can even connect multiple accounts to a single FinTech provider, like Betterment or Wealthfront who can show you your overall holdings in one place. Finally, step five, once you've gone through all those steps, the data network will share the information you've authorized with the application you've selected, and you get to start using that app. I mentioned already that the reason data networks exist is to take on the complexity of building millions of connections across thousands of providers. The important thing to know is that data networks are the safer way to share financial information. Plaid was founded on the principle that people have a right to their financial information. So every Plaid product is built with control, transparency, and security in mind. But what do I mean by safer? Well, before Plaid, if you wanted to connect your accounts, you might have had to share your login information directly with third parties so that they could retrieve your information themselves. With Plaid, we manage our own secure ecosystem, where our only responsibility is to keep your information safe and secure. Before data networks, it wasn't always clear who was interacting with your financial data. Plaid, as you'll see in a moment, makes it very clear who we are and what we do. Before data networks, if you wanted to stop sharing your data, you might have had to change your password. With Plaid, you can turn your data on and off inside a dedicated portal. A bit more about Plaid's approach to data sharing. Data only flows with consumer's permission. There is no data moving across a data network without you telling a data network to move it. All of the data that moves is secured via encryption, and we partner with financial institutions and fintechs to deliver the services that consumers need. And to be even more explicit, data sharing is not a free flow of data, a sale of data for marketing, or a limited way just to, or limited to just one technical way to share your data. So what does it look like to connect your account using Plaid? This isn't any additional step you need to take. It's already there when you sign up for a FinTech application that uses a data network like Plaid. There are two places where you'll see Plaid today and both give you control over your data. The first is in Plaid Link, which is where you establish your initial connection. Here we see a set of steps that you walk through when you download a new FinTech application. You'll see this set of screens where Plaid will introduce itself, help you find your bank to connect to, and ask you to enter your credentials, which is a necessary step for initiating that connection. Then you'll be asked to do some step up security, possibly entering a one-time passcode from your phone to prove that it's you. Then you'll have a chance to choose which of your accounts you want to connect. So if you're using just a budgeting tool, maybe you only want to connect your checking account. But if it's a savings tool, also your savings account, and so on. Then Plaid will let you know that the connection was successful and send you back to your app. But what about after the connection? That's where Plaid Portal comes in. This is a website that you can visit to manage all of your connections in one place. You can visit Plaid Portal today at my.plaid.com, create an account, and see and manage your connections across all of your institutions and applications. Plaid Portal has three modules, activity, which is an overview, accounts, which is your financial accounts, and apps, which is the FinTech applications you've connected to. 
If you click on financial institution, it will take you to a page showing what accounts and data types you've connected and which apps you've connected them for. And you can manage connections, including revoking access to stop the flow of data. Just know the applications will, will not continue to work anymore if you stop sharing your data with them because it is the data that you're sharing that helps those applications function. And this is the view from the Manage Apps page where you can do the same action. Plaid's business as a data network depends on our ability to keep consumers safe. So we practice the highest levels of data security, encrypting your data, using multi-factor authentication, and building on the most secure infrastructure and monitoring, or monitoring around the clock with security testing and collaboration with partners. If you or any of the consumers you're working with want to learn more about Plaid safety practices, you can visit plaid.com safety. So that was a lot of information. And to recap, three takeaways for this group. Number one, FinTech can help consumers have more choices for managing their money. Nine in 10 consumers use some sort of digital finance technology today. Number two, data networks enable you to connect and control your data. They work with your bank and with fintechs to keep your data secure. And number three, you can use data control dashboards provided by some, but not all, data networks. Visiting pages like my.plaid.com can help you to control your data. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I will be around for the question and answer at the end. Back to you, Linda. Thank you, Ben. Now, audience, while I'm turning the controls over to our next speaker, uh, which is Sean, you have time to type in a few questions uh, uh, in your question box. Okay, uh, Sean, you have control. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you to the Consumer Action Team for having me. Um, and thanks, Ben, for that informative first presentation. My name is Sean Creenan. I am a senior FinTech Risk and Policy Advisor at the San Francisco Fed and lead our work on financial health and inclusion. Uh, before I begin, I have to give our usual disclaimer at the Fed, which is that my comments today reflect my own personal opinions and views and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco or the Federal Reserve System. So just as a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about today, I just really wanna give everyone a sense of the massive and somewhat opaque still data ecosystem that is really motivating um, a lot of our discussion today. It's creating a lot of opportunities for businesses and customers um, and also introducing new risks. And then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, key needs around transparency, business responsibility, consumer control, um, kind of where we are in terms of policy and regulation and where we may need to go. And just the, the really the, the challenge and the complexity around these issues. So just a little bit about uh, our team at the San Francisco Fed. We, I, I come from the San Francisco Fed's FinTech team. We sit within the division of supervision and credit. So think, think the folks that help supervise uh, financial institutions as part of the Fed, uh, Fed's role uh, beyond its role as a central bank handling monetary policy. We are one of the, the three main federal banking regulators. Uh, but so our role within that broader mission is to promote responsible and inclusive innovation in the financial system through supervision, thought leadership, and outreach. So we're a, a go-to source within the Federal Reserve on all things fintech. We do a lot of industry and community engagement, uh, like today's event. And then we're aiming to embed financial health as a first principle in the Fed's assessment of new technology. And that's that's what I do. Uh, behind me is a, is a big team, and that includes uh, uh, one of the, really the country's foremost experts in consumer financial data issues. Uh, my colleague, Caitlin Asser, has helped me prepare for this event. She's actually on a rotation, otherwise she'd probably help me today. But we have a, a real depth of expertise on this, and so would also welcome outreach later on and, and look forward to the questions. Um, but just very quickly, uh, you know, I mentioned this concept of defining and embedding the concept of financial health. Just wanted to give you a flavor for, for what, what I mean by that. And I know we actually have a colleague, Dan Murphy, from the Financial Health Network that will be following me. Um, and, and his organization is a great resource for this as well. But just if you think about moving beyond concepts of, of basic financial access and thinking about your consumers that you're working with, thinking about the outcomes of the financial services which they engage with using these new sources of data and, and, and uh, companies like Plaid that are enabling a lot of connectivity. But thinking of it from the perspective of payments, um, does someone have the ability to transfer and receive funds, including wages at a low cost and a cadence that works for their life? Uh, from a savings perspective, do they have access to safe 
liquid savings, earning a market rate of interest, um, and then thinking about indicators of these various outcomes. So from the payments perspective, what's the average speed of a payment, average cost, um, from a savings perspective, you know, basic savings rate given a disposable income level. Um, also thinking more um, broadly about indicators of resilience, so emergency savings, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. There's a lot of different outcomes and, and kind of categories we might talk about, but we would also include data rights in this framework. So understanding from a consumer perspective how data is tracked across one's digital life, how it impacts access to financial services, and being aware of the use of more advanced behavioral science informed products. So these are a little bit more qualitative, but indicators of all of this might be our consumers provided with transparency about data collection and use, are there control options where possible, is there adequate disclosure of the use of advanced techniques like artificial intelligence, the provision of services, um, and is there some sort of control and protection from the use of so-called dark patterns, which are essentially subliminal uh, techniques uh, designed to drive certain behaviors that may not be in the consumer's best interests. A lot more here, I won't go into it today, uh, but just so you have an understanding of how we think about financial health and, and its connection to, um, to, to these data issues. So I wanna first just do a little bit of level setting beyond what Ben has already done in terms of just the ever uh, increasing complexity and growth in the data ecosystem. This is just one visual of the rapid growth in just the um, uh, uh, amount of, of data out there, data breaches, this is kind of from our security perspective, but just so you have a sense of the growth, even from um, just a few years ago, by 2025, we're expecting a fourfold increase um, in the amount of digital data ever created uh, just over the span of six years. And if you go back to 2012, so a 13 year period going up to 2025, you're talking about 175 times an increase. And it's just growing and growing at an exponential rate. And, and there's really no, um, no indication that this, that this pace of growth is, is going to slow down at any point. But so just uh, something that you're probably all aware of, but really just a lot of data out there across society, across the economy, across the financial system. So along with this, we're seeing changing social attitudes around data. We're seeing large tech firms um, in, um, in, in uh, competition with each other over the use of these data. And the, the, you know, an example of this would be Facebook and Apple in disputes over new features of the latest um, iOS um, that, that are designed to create more controls around privacy, but may impact the business models of other major tech firms. Um, the rise of so-called nutrition labels, so consumers being a little bit more aware, or maybe demanding more disclosure, more information around the use of their data. Um, and I think one thing I would really emphasize here is kind of an evolution beyond a common um, discussion around privacy. So I think for a long time in the United States, there's been a real focus on that, understandably so, but really a broadening of attitudes. So thinking beyond just privacy, but how is the data being used? Is it in the background kind of affecting the way services are delivered to me? Um, you know, there's a, a, a documentary that came out over the last year called The Social Dilemma, which is an interesting look at this issue, kind of a stylized look at the way a social media network might uh, use a variety of different uh, data sources and advanced behavioral science informed product design to, to drive uh, regular engagement uh, by their customers um, without, the, without the customer really understanding it. So a lot of, a lot of increasing intention around the issue, not necessarily uh, uh, always positive, some unease about it, um, but, but definitely changing social attitudes um, on the customer side as the business side um, continues to grow um, just in the, the, the use of data and the, and the system becomes increasingly complex. And so hand in hand with that, we have an evolving policy landscape that's attempting to respond to changing views and changing risks. So if you think back to the previous decades, the traditional focus area here would be, well, first of all, uh, legal permitted government access to, to certain data that um, has some um, broader use for the government's um, ability to conduct uh, anti-money laundering or counter-terrorist financing or just um, a variety of different activities um, from a law enforcement perspective. From a cybersecurity perspective, of course, there's been a lot of attention paid to this issue for many decades in the financial industry specifically, which in many ways is considered um, uh, a leading sector for cybersecurity, but just focused on the, the breach and the security of the data. And so now over the last decade and, and, and even further back, we're seeing an emergence of new focus areas, as I mentioned, privacy, but then a broader broadening awareness of other, what we might call data rights. So beyond the right to privacy, whether it's 
uh, right to, to port your data, uh, just understanding the way it might be used beyond um, uh, the, the more obvious ways that, that allow you to use a product day to day, but other, other ways it's used in the background. And then most ex perhaps most excitingly for, for people like all of us on this call is the rise of open banking. And so you've actually seen the Biden administration coming out with new executive orders around this. But the idea that these data flows can permit a, kind of a, a range of new access to financial services um, uh, just by, um, by connecting data better between various financial service providers and their customers. So I want to talk a little bit about opportunity and risk. Um, like I said, I think a lot about the potential benefits of um, new technology and innovation, and that includes data for the, from the perspective of a customer, of a consumer's financial health. So let me talk a little bit. These are stylized examples of how these new data flows and, uh, can, can actually help improve the delivery and quality of financial services moving forward. So if you think about an average consumer's transaction and deposit account that they may hold with a bank, or maybe it's a, a non-bank uh, fintech, say, say a PayPal, uh, there's a wealth of data there just on basic inflow and outflow um, that, that re represents a customer's typical month-to-month um, -month economic existence. So there's a lot you can do with this data in theory, um, and there's a lot of innovation going on right now, and I think there's more to come, but at a basic level, just measuring spending. So what are the timing of income flows in, uh, bill payments out? So just looking at those two, uh, two categories, you know, seeing if there's uh, kind of a recurrence of overdrafts, people kind of spending a little bit more than they're, they're, they're taking in and on a week to week, month to month basis. Um, and then taking that, data, that basic data, transaction data, and kind of aggregating it, averaging it into the inflows and outflows to reveal a pattern of cash flow, and then using that to identify opportunities for savings, given typical income and expenses. The Fed has an annual survey on household economic well-being, and there are, this is a statistic that you commonly see referred to in the media, but the average household um, may not have uh, sufficient emergency savings to cover, say, a $400 or $500 uh, expense. So the car, a car breaks down, you need a, a roof repair, whatever it might be. And so clearly there's a lot of issues in this country for, uh, of, of uh, just savings for uh, near-term economic shocks. And so if you take this uh, data that you're building up from the transaction level and you're aggregating into these uh, monthly or quarterly cash flows, you can start to identify those opportunities to save and encourage it. So encouraging meeting an emergency savings goal or promoting other long-term savings goals. So uh, definitely um, some exciting stuff potentially from the use of this data. From a borrowing and credit side, there's also lots of interesting activity going on. So more inclusive credit scorings and risk assessments. So thinking beyond a traditional credit score, particularly for those populations that may not have access to, not have previously had a credit score, or maybe they've had some experience with predatory finance, and so they have an artificially, what, what might otherwise be considered an artificially low score given other indicators of their credit worthiness. You can imagine someone's management of their inflow outflow in that transaction account, or say that they're paying their, their rent on time, say they're in their late 20s, they don't have a credit score, but then they've been paying rent for five years on time. Imagine the power of that sort of data. Um, from the perspective of after getting in, uh, after borrowing and, and connecting to the formal credit system, monitoring your debt load, tracking for sustainability, being able to educate customers. Uh, you can imagine proactive loan servicing, so early interventions based on real-time measures of credit performance, uh, tracking a downturn to identify borrowers in need of assistance and kind of more rapid um, action to help them through that. Um, you could also imagine future, and we're seeing this innovation in, particularly in the, um, the FinTech arena of variable repayment models based on cash flows. So if you think of a small business, say a food truck that uses a digital payments platform that has great insight into that, that business's day-to-day, uh, -day, week to week, month to month cash flows, there may be uh, new models to uh, provide lending to that business in a way that's a little bit less risky from the lender perspective because they are capturing a lot of that activity on their platform. So they could have a variable payment model where they're saying a certain percentage of those cash flows uh, and over whatever period we'll, we would be used to repay a loan. So if you have a down month, you're paying a little bit less. So just a lot of interesting um, stuff that can be enabled by these open data flows. And then just a final slide here on the kind of the opportunity set and kind of the, the pros and cons, just thinking about a future where products are designed for healthier financial behavior. So 
firms in the emerging digital financial system will in some ways more easily track and impact financial health potentially uh, for, for good and for bad. So on a positive side, you can imagine identifying other financial health characteristics using a combination of qualitative survey data. So you could ask customers, are they feeling like their financial health is in good shape or they're just coping with, with certain issues or they're really struggling. And then you can map those those types of customers to certain other characteristics that a that a that a, a fintech or a bank may have based on that transaction account data, and you could come up with a more predictive model of what financial health might look like. Design interventions based on observed financial health challenges encourage a broader mindset around financial health and planning uh, beyond just simple banking services. So things like investments, insurance. So a lot of interesting ideas there, and again, reliant on that data. On the downside, um, there are areas where new techniques, so behavioral science informed product design, which could be used for good, could also be encouraging behavior that might may undermine financial health. There's uh, a graphic here, it's a, a rocket emoji. You may have followed the, the mean trading uh, of early 2021, uh, particularly um, around the, the stock GameStop, but there are a number of other um, stocks involved. Uh, but there was a lot of concern that, um, that new platforms were encouraging the use of sophisticated, sophisticated financial products and kind of using uh, low friction, well, well-designed user interfaces, plus things like gamification or other behavioral science techniques to create endless engagement um, or otherwise undermine a customer's ability to recognize or manage risk to the detriment of their financial health. And so there's lots of concerns around if you have a certain kind of business model, uh, what are the incentives for the business vis-a-vis -vis the consumer and how are they using this, this, these techniques and what's the role of data in all of that. So picking up on that, on those risks, um, so I wanna drill more specifically into the data issues and risks to consumers. So that first that first concept that's not, not particularly new, but the idea of data breaches or inappropriate transfers. So it could cause things like identity theft, fraud, loss of funds. Uh, another issue is related to discrimination and bias. New sources of data may be used for something like I was describing, a more inclusive credit score, or they could just be excluding people based on old patterns that, that reflect existing discrimination. There's this risk of cognitive capture and nudging, so that behavioral science informed product design. Um, are there other business models that are driving this activity? So I think it's well understood that uh, a lot of social media firms are mining data for the purpose of advertising, but I mentioned another example there where you might have a firm whose business whose revenue is driven by uh, so-called payment for order flow. So um, the more that a uh, customer base trades on a, a stock platform, an investment platform, the more money that um, that business could uh, could make. And so what are the incentives there to, to, to use this, these, this, this data combined with sophisticated design techniques to drive what we might consider unhealthy behavior? And then more generally, to the extent that all of these risks exist and customers, consumers are feeling like they're not being managed or that they need more protection, uh, we can see broader and reduced, tr reduced trust or broader distrust in digital systems. So the digital economy, the digital financial system, and digital society in general. Um, and so this is, this is why we're here, why I'm here, why others in this space are here to think about the consumer protection and data rights issues and, and how we can try to capture these benefits while mitigating risk. So an example that I think is, is really a good one in this space, if you go back to the 1970s, uh, before I was born, uh, but the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, what, what uh, regulators would refer to as Regulation E, Reg E, uh, created trust in digital transactions by providing consumer protections from fraudulent activity. So if you could imagine at that time, ATMs were coming out, um, you had uh, the rise of payment cards, but people were, were were afraid. Well, what if they what if they did something wrong? What if someone stole their card? What if there was just some fraud or some sort of loss on their part? Who would be liable? And so, it put liability on the businesses that operated these uh, these networks that enabled digital transactions. And to me, and I think um, many people uh, born after the passage of that act, it's sort of unimaginable to to consider a world where there weren't there weren't so many digital transactions that um, that are part of the, the modern economy. And so, I think we can say that 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 act was successful. And so it, it, it creates a, a framework, it allows us to imagine how uh, more robust consumer protection can actually enable a lot of innovation and competition in this space. Um, you have the general data protection regulation in Europe, which has certainly um, increased uh, attention and, and investment in, um, in data hygiene practices, and that impacts big tech firms that operate in, in Europe and the United States. But it's safe to say that there is no comprehensive data rights and protection here in the United States at this point. We do have certain um, 
certain laws and regulations, and I think Dan is going to talk about this in a bit, related to financial products and services, related to healthcare data, and then there are certain states like the state of California, uh, which does have more comprehensive regimes, but at a national federal level, uh, we don't quite have that. So just going to very quickly, um, just so in the interest of time, talk about a couple of other connected challenges and as risks. So to the extent that people are interested in using alternative data, using new sources of data to um, provide um, greater access to finance to, to, to groups that may be underrepresented in the financial system, historically excluded, um, there are challenges here with the use of data. So the prior lack of access may lead to a lack of representation in a data set. Uh, it may also uh, be that there are um, kind of in, there are factors within historical data that are discriminatory and that by using that data for future, say, lending decisions, um, you're actually just going to reinvent some of the patterns of exclusion. So there's a lot of challenges here. Um, also, to the extent that you're using data to, to try to drive inclusion of a certain customer segment, it may be that the risks vary across different groups, resources vary across different groups. So if you imagine trying to include more immigrants, in the credit system, you could see a distinction between a, a middle-class, uh, well-educated migrant um, who comes from a country where they had access to a cr credit score, they had a credit bureau there, and trying to port that data. You know, there are innovators out there that are trying to port such data into the U.S. financial system to enable that person to borrow, versus a low-income migrant from a country with less developed um, financial system, not an existing credit bureau, may not have that ability to, to have that score even reliance. So there's a lot of different types of challenges and it's not necessarily a one size fits all approach that can work. And then relatedly, I think it's important to remember that data is a different type of resource. It has utility beyond the individual. Um, there are both potential competing claims. And what I mean by that is you could imagine a customer that could use the data in a certain, for a certain way and there are other um, kind of stakeholders and ecosystem that may kind of work at different purposes, but they can be doing that at the same time. And these are not exclusive uses of the data. So my use of the data does not, it's not a scarce resource. It's not, it doesn't mean that someone else in this ecosystem can't be using it at the same time. So it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, particularly when you're trying to think about how to design rules um, and regulations for, for proper use. Um, one example here of balancing the individual versus the collective is some countries and jurisdictions have mandated the use of cell phone data to uh, do contact tracing or verifying quarantine during the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, but we can also see a lot of positives uh, in balancing the individual, other positives in balancing the individual versus the collective here uh, in terms of innovation and research. Um, you know, if you if you consider a cybersecurity breach, if you don't share data about a breach, about an incident, um, it may be harder to respond more holistically from a perspective of a uh, the financial system regulator or just uh, you know uh, banks that don't talk to each other about cybersecurity risks. Um, there are risks if you're not sharing that data. Um, and then the broader issue of just uh, undermining um, trust in the broader digital economy, digital society, um, and, and the, the importance of considering that beyond just the individual in, in all of these issues. So this is kind of where we get to um, our concept for getting us closer to a state of transparency, business responsibility, and, and consumer control. And just want to um, leave you, if, if there's one thing that you take away from today, I think we want to emphasize that there are severe limitations to just a, a traditional model of disclosure and individual consent. So I'll just read here from this quote uh, from a, a, a noted expert in this space. Data subjects have the fewest resources of every party in the chain of data flows, and they are on the wrong side of substantial information and power disparities. While control is an attractive goal in isolation, it currently comes with a practical and legal obligation. If you do not exercise that control, you are at risk. So I think what's important to remember is here is even if you have a, a good disclosure, even if you have some controls, uh, it's, it's not clear that people have the time the education, uh, just the the emotional, um, uh, the the ability to handle if, if they're dealing with something st stressful during the day to handle all of this and to process it and to make the decisions uh, to protect themselves. So we can't just put it all on the consumer to to read the disclosure and then consent and then and then say that we've done our job. Um, there are all sorts of behavioral barriers, biases, ways that that uh, people may not be processing a disclosure the way we might assume they would when we design uh, some sort of rule around it. Uh, diverse needs and bandwidth, of course, I already mentioned some of that. Um, and then there's an extent to which it may be a, a, a non-granular control or consent. So a take it or leave it. That you either can or can't my, use my data, and maybe maybe there needs to be more granularity there. So what does what does this all mean? It, 
it means that, that we need more comprehensive data protection beyond just transparency and control. Uh, it also needs, it requires a conversation around something like protection from, from what, or what are we actually talking about here? So it's not just protection from a data breach, it's not just being safe, uh, but it's also the conduct of those custodians of the data, whether it's a financial institution, a data network, uh, or other parties in the broader system. Uh, what's the scope of the protection? Uh, when you think about data formats, there's a lot of attention now paid to um, de-identifying data sets. But there's also other techniques where uh, individual customer can be re-identified with a synthesis of that de-identified data with another uh, rich data set that, that can be used to, to again, re-identify. So, so you think you're anonymous and then suddenly someone has figured out that that's you. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, and then from the perspective of liabilities and remedies, again, getting back to that example of Regulation E and 1970s promoting digital transactions through better protection, you know, what are the liabilities on the, the business side and the customer side? What remedies does a, does a customer have? So this is where we would put for your consideration the concept of data rights. And so this is representing uh, different tiers of rights that you might have kind of starting at the bottom of the period, most fundamental, just a right to, to basic data protection and transparency around the use of your data. Uh, moving up, a right to simplified consent, so something that's digestible, understandable, um, being able to revoke consent to correct data that's inaccurate going up the ability to port and export your data so imagine that alternative or inclusive credit score taking your activity with one provider or even a non-financial provider uh, elsewhere in the digital economy and society and using that data to enable something else moving up again the ability to delete uh, delete your data in europe there's been a, a long-running conversation about the right to be forgotten which is an interesting philosophical question for another day but just the the ability to actually not just correct but to delete, delete data and then if you imagine uh, more specific uses of data do you have the ability to consent to more granular uses um, and finally if the data is being used in certain ways is there an opportunity for you to be compensated for your data and so i should step back as well and another visual you might imagine here, or another way to organize this information is, is the, is the data being used for the primary purpose of uh, delivering the product that the consumer is, is um, that the consumer wants from the service provider, or is there some sort of connected legal obligation? Kind of on a secondary level, is the data being used to maybe improve the product uh, by that provider, or maybe it's being shared in other ways with other um, with other um, partners of that firm. And then kind of more on the, the, the tertiary side is, is there another way that the data is being monetized? And so understanding those different uses introduces different tiers of potential data rights. So if you imagine that kind of more tertiary use, it's not really getting me access to a product, it's not a legal obligation, it's not even really improving the product that I want to use. Uh, can I consent to that? Can I be compensated for that? These are questions we might ask if we had a more tiered approach to data rights. So as I close up here, I wanted to leave you with a couple of slides just to kind of take away to try to summarize, but just reminders about the roles and responsibilities of consumers, businesses, and regulators. So again, having data rights um, and disclosures and controls are not a substitute for protection. So there has to be some level of business responsibility in protecting consumers here. Um, second, Again, this is complicated. Data are a shared resource. It's not just about ownership at an individual level or at the firm that's offering a service. They're a shared resource. There are competing claims to a certain extent, and they're not necessarily exclusive, even if they're competing, because uh, I can use my data, you can use my data, we can all be using the data at the same time. It's not, it's not a tangible thing that one person controls at any one time. And then as you can imagine, and as I've already said, and Dan will probably go into in a second, this is a complex policy space. And the financial regulatory uh, regime in this country is already incredibly complex. You have state level, you have lots of federal level regulators, um, and there's uh, all sorts of other non-financial sources of data that also are increasingly being um, at least considered, if not outright used, to make financial decisions. So it's very complicated. And then finally, if you can imagine a, a point where we actually figure out how to, how to do all this and how, how at least the principles and the rules and the data rights that we think need to be enshrined, implementation feasibility is still essential. And it's not necessarily always easy to design something that at the end of the day, uh, a tech firm can, can implement just because the, the concept is, is robust and sound from a policy perspective or, um, or whatever other perspectives you might bring to this, this, issue, this issue. All right, so I've got a little bit over by 20 minutes, but just final slide here on, or second to last slide, but final slide where I really have something else 
beyond a, a thank you and more more links to follow all this but just some helpful considerations this is more for you those working with the consumers not necessarily for the consumers themselves to be asking although we really hope that they are aware of the role of data networks of the role of their data and, and sort of, kind of some basic questions to just be asking just to at the very least to be aware right but so for you questions to be asking what data are being collected how and for what purpose are consumers informed about this activity to what extent and depth do consumers have a choice over which data is taken and how it is used? Are there privacy laws that apply? How are data within an entity protected from external breach and internal misuse? Do consumers have active control over data related to them? For example, the ability to delete data or port data to a new entity. What happens to consumer related data after it is no longer being used? So for example, if you were to ask a data network to delete your data, how do we know that the other firm that's working with the data network would delete it? So lots of questions, it's a lot to unpack. Keep following this space, there's a lot more to come. On that note, I just wanted to thank you for listening and thank the organizers for this. Um, I will would recommend that you check out some of these links from my colleague, Caitlin, and also if you're interested in kind of more of a high level overview of the potential in the space for technology and policy to drive financial health, we have that podcast that I list at the bottom, Financial Inclusion and Beyond. So thank you so much. Back to you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Sean, for a great presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Murphy. And Dan, I believe you should have control. Yes, you have control. You can take it away. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Linda. And, and really thank you to the whole Consumer Action team for inviting me and, and to Plaid for sponsoring the event and just inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Dan Murphy. I'm the policy manager at the Financial Health Network, where, among other things, I lead our work on consumer data rights and financial services. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about two main themes. First, I'll discuss some specific consumer protections at the federal level, uh, which I think flows nicely from Sean's discussion of consumer data rights and protections more broadly. Uh, and second, I'm also going to discuss the results of a nationally representative survey that we fielded earlier this year which I think might help to explain what consumers understand about this ecosystem and how they might prefer it to look. And hopefully that'll be a good transition to some Q&A time. Uh, let's see, trying to advance it. There we go. So um, first of all, to start with consumer protection, last year we partnered with FinReg Lab, Flourish Ventures, and Mitchell Sandler to produce a legal and regulatory landscape of federal consumer protections pertaining to consumer financial data. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a high-level overview of some of the relevant statutes and regulations at play here, but for a more thorough picture, I really encourage you to take a look at our analysis, and I'm happy to make sure the link gets sent around later. Um, I'll also just note that here, uh, these, are, these are just the protections at the federal level. State-level protections have largely carved out financial services, um, but there are certainly relevant considerations at the state level, as Sean was starting to mention. Uh, we probably do need another panel to discuss that one, though. So just to start with though, and I think probably most remain to data aggregators. Um, data portability, as I think was mentioned before, the consumer's right to portability comes from section 1033 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and I'll just read here what this, what it says is that subject to rules prescribed by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a consumer financial services provider must make available to a consumer information in the control or possession of the provider concerning the consumer financial product or service that the consumer obtains from the provider. In other words, financial institutions have to make a consumer's financial data available to them. Uh, the genesis of this really is actually in competition policy in a lot of ways. Uh, I think uh, both panelists earlier mentioned open banking as something that's happened uh, both in the UK and, and abroad, open finance is becoming more of a trend. The idea in some other markets was really just that uh, financial services wasn't a terribly competitive space. And that one reason for that were information asymmetries that were preventing a lot of competition, particularly in the small business market, um, but also in consumer financial markets. And that giving consumers more transparency was a way to try to mitigate those and bring in some new entrants. Um, so, you know, this has kind of been an international trend, but in the US, Section 1033 is our version of that. Um, the president's uh, executive order, as Sean mentioned before, um, actually encouraged the CFPB to undertake a rulemaking on 1033. 
Uh, the CFPB was already in that process. The comment period closed earlier this year on uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, but basically, it sounds like this is going to be happening. And it's good that there's going to be a rulemaking on this because there's a lot of open questions. Um, just to take a few, for example, one open question is what data are covered by Section 1033? Um, and relatedly, whether and under what conditions could a financial institution restrict data access? So, for example, if a particular point of data um, is something that they don't think they should have to share, um, you know, where does that where is that line drawn? Um, also, whether and under what conditions they must permit data access to agents and representatives acting on a consumer's behalf. You know, um, Plaid is one data aggregator. There's another a number of other data aggregators or data networks that access consumer financial data on behalf of consumers. Um, and so that's a big question as well. Uh, what processes and protections should be required to, uh, regarding consumer consent? Uh, ben showed Plaid's consent flow, but there's others out there as well. And the question is, you know, are there particular pr procedures that data aggregators and others should be required to follow? And how does Section 1033 interact with pre-existing statutes and regulations, which I'll move on to now. So as Sean mentioned, uh, we do see that actually, um, unlike a lot of other sectors in the United States, the financial services sector does have a broadly applicable um, privacy regulation, but it's a fairly low bar, I think it's fair to say. So um, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley, oops, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, the privacy rulings of the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act prohibits financial institutions from sharing consumers' non-public personal information with a non-affiliated company. However, and as you'll see, I've bolded this even more, the unless uh, part really is the more important point here because the, there's, really, there's two really big exceptions here. First, if a consumer has received uh, a notice and an opportunity to, to opt out, it can be shared. And there's a lot of other very complicated exceptions as well. So essentially, most consumers will receive you know, a couple times a year, depending on the relationship, uh, in the mail, a slip of paper with some complex terms and conditions, and somewhere in there it explains to you how, how your financial data is used. Unless you take the, the affirmative step to opt out, which might include going on the website and clicking some boxes, or might even include calling the 1-800 number, you probably uh, haven't opted out, and most consumers haven't opted out of sharing their financial data. Uh, the safeguards rule from a security perspective is al also under Graham Leach Bliley, which establishes standards and requirements for storage, security, and protection of financial data. I won't spend too much time on security, but this is also a really big piece here um, and is also woven in through some of the other statutes I'll talk, to, talk about as well. And then also under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, you know, FICRA imposes a variety of obligations, uh, the permissible purpose for which a consumer report can be obtained the kinds of information that can be obtained in a consumer report and the circumstances under which a consumer report information can be used for marketing purposes. So from a privacy perspective, the financial services sector actually has more protections than a lot of other sectors in the US. But, and I think the, the GLEBA privacy rule um, loopholes are really a good way, or really the biggest example of the fact that it's really a very low bar. Now, moving on from privacy and sticking with the FICRA uh, theme, another really important piece of uh, financial data in particular is accuracy. And you know, anyone who's followed the stories of Equifax and stories, the stories of a lot of other uh, credit reporting issues, just last week, I think the CFPB came out with a new report saying that uh, both Black and Latinx communities were more likely to have a high degree of, um, of uh, inaccurate credit reports. Um, there's a lot of issues in the credit reporting industry as well that make accuracy protections really important. So uh, FICRA stat was established to promote fairness and accuracy in the information held, held by consumer reporting agencies and entities contributing to and using information received from those entities. There's three, uh, there's three provisions that are really important here. First, adverse action. So basically when uh, consumer report users, so for example, a lender, uh, they might be required to make a certain disclosure to you when they take an adverse action against a consumer based on what they got from a consumer report. So if a lender decides not to extend credit, they have to explain why. Uh, second, consumer access to consumer reports. I think most of you probably know that nationwide CRAs are required to make available one free consumer report to consumers every year. 
Um, and second, accuracy requirements for third, rather, accuracy requirements for CRAs and furnishers. So FICRA requires both CRAs and furnishers to institute policies and procedures to promote data accuracy. And when we say furnishers here, this can be really anybody who's giving data to the credit reporting uh, uh, um, credit reporting agencies uh, that allow them to make their credit score. So we want to make sure that both the act, the information at CRAs is accurate and the information that they're receiving is accurate. However, kind of going back to the questions around 1033. There's a lot of issues and open questions about how this old regime interacts with potentially the new regime under Dodd-Frank Section 1033. So when might data aggregators or data networks qualify as a CRA and when might data sources act as a furnisher? So if a fintech is a lending fintech and a uh, data aggregator is, is giving them information for the purposes of credit underwriting, um, is the bank, for example, that they're pulling from a furnisher? These are some of the open questions that we hope might get we might get some more clarity from from 1033 rulemaking. Second, should aggregators be sources um, aggregators and sources be held to the same accuracy and dispute resolution requirements? So obviously, this ecosystem that Ben and Sean described really well um, with you know the arrival of fintechs is really different than a lot of the older more traditional financial data ecosystem constructs we might have thought about before. And so there's a really big question about, you know, are the policies and procedures that we look to today, are they really the right fit for the new ecosystem? And fairness is another big issue as well, which I think Sean touched on as well. So uh, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, along with the Fair Housing Act, the COA pro prohibits discrimination in credit transactions. Uh, the law states that discrimination can come in the form of both disparate treatment and disparate impact. And there's a lot of open questions to here too, just as uh, new sources of financial and non-financial data and credit scoring and underwriting, you know, will they reduce or exacerbate disparities along protected class lines? I think there's a lot more research that's needed um, for particular types of data to be able to answer that question better. But it's certainly a really important question from a fairness perspective. And also just where disparities exist, is the, new, is the use of the, these new data sources consistent with ECOA? You know, under ECOA's uh, disparate impact theory, there really is a pretty big exception actually for unless a policy or practice effectuates a legitimate business justification that can't be achieved otherwise. And so, you know, that could be a kind of a big loophole and it could pre present some other issues. And so that's an issue as well. And finally, and Sean already touched on this with his credit card and ATM example, so I won't spend too much time, but a related issue here is really liability under the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. So this governs various type of electronic fund transfers from consumer accounts. Um, you know, it addresses consumer financial data in another way, in a number of ways, not only um, from a liability perspective, actually. Um, but there's some open questions about how EFTA should be applied to emerging business models such as PFM apps, so apps that allow you to see multiple accounts in one place, uh, or digital wallets, which really aren't quite a bank account, but you might be transacting from. There's a lot of questions there too. And maybe most important from a 1033 perspective and from a data aggregator perspective, are consumers liable for unauthorized transactions due to a data breach at a data aggregator or misconduct by an employee of an aggregator? There's a big question around um, access methods and if a consumer is giving the aggregator uh, or somebody else uh, their, their login credentials, there's a question about what that means for EFTA's protections and could consumers be left in the lurch or unprotected. So from there, I'll just move on really quickly to talking about some consumer understanding and preferences. Um, I just do just want to underscore first, though, there's a lot of other regulations and statutes at play here that I wasn't able to cover, and that was really just a very high-level overview of those that I did cover. Um, another one here is uh, you know, UDAP under the FTC Act. There's also probably less relevant for this audience, but third-party risk management considerations that I think are really important here. But um, but yeah, I definitely encourage those who are interested to check out our legal and regulatory landscape, which is a useful resource for all of this. But on to consumer understanding and preferences. Uh, earlier this year, we released a report based on a, um, let me go back, 
based on a nationally representative survey that we ran with uh, NORC at the University of Chicago, which really sought to understand consumers' understanding of this ecosystem and their preferences for how it might look better. So I'll read through some of the key findings really quick. Uh, data portability, the right to port consumers' data. 62% of consumers think their bank or credit union should, should be required to share data about them if they direct it to. Uh, data privacy, approximately 90% of consumers favor an opt-in standard for banks, tech companies, and fintech apps to share data about them. So if you remember my, my discussion of Graham Leach Bliley before, approximately 90% of consumers think it should work the other way around. Second, um, on data privacy, approximately 90% of consumers would prefer that banks, tech companies, and fintech apps not share data about them for marketing purposes. I think this really gets to a lot of the questions around um, cognitive control that uh, Sean was talking about and consumers' preference is really changing around how their data is used for marketing. And finally, data minimization. 87% of consumers favor data minimization, but only 41% think it's taking place in the market today. And I'll talk about that a little more in a second. Some more key findings, you know, these views on data portability, minimization, and opt-in standards don't vary with political party affiliation or really with any other uh, with any other uh, demographic group. They were consistent broadly, so I, we think that's a really powerful signal as well. 68% of consumers in our sample have linked fintech apps to their checking account. Um, so that's a little bit more context just in terms of what this population looks like. 93% uh, of fintech app users and borrowers aren't aware of data aggregators' presence in their financial lives. I think just from a consumer protection perspective, this is a really interesting point as well and an important one. I think, uh, you know, my.plaid.com, as Ben was talking about, is a great step forward in making sure that consumers have that direct connection with the data aggregator. However, you know, with the world as it is today and folks who are more used to their traditional providers, they also might have the opportunity to be able to exert some control through their traditional bank um, or through the app that they're using. And so this ecosystem is still evolving, but right now that connection between consumers and data aggregators is still very much in the building process. Finally, uh, from a bank switching perspective, you know, we did some research here and I won't spend too much time on it, but just because of the genesis of 1033 as a competition policy measure, we thought it would be interesting just to get a sense of how many consumers have switched banks in the last couple of years. We saw that 75% or sorry, 70% of consumers have had their primary financial institution for more than five years, and 40% have had it for more than 15 years. Um, and of those who've had it for five years or less, only 20% report ever having another PFI before that. So um, really very low rates of bank switching. And so I think the, the message here there is that there's still more work, work to do from a competition perspective. Just to get a little deeper on these results, and I'll try to go through this quickly to leave some room for Q&A. Um, there's a question about, you know, this uh, data minimization uh, principle. And, you know, one thing that I thought was interesting is we asked consumers how much of their checking account data is their fintech app capable of accessing? And we saw a relatively even break here, right? About 41% said they only the data they need, 25% assumed it was all the data, and a full third said they just don't know. So pretty even break there. But then we asked a similar question, how much of your checking account data should FinTech apps be able to access with the same types of response options? And here it was you know, very clear that consumers greatly prefer that it only be the data they need. So I think this really underscores the difference between the data ecosystem that consumers assume exists today and the ones that they wish, the one that they wish would. Another theme that I think uh, you know some others started to touch on as well is there's a big question here about whether disclosures are enough from a data privacy or broader data protection perspective. So we asked consumers what they did with the privacy policies they received from their bank, from their fintech, and from a tech company, and we saw that just you know at most five percent said they read all of any of them, and for all of them the vast majority said that they only you know either, either they didn't read it or they just skimmed it. So we think that's pretty interesting, especially given that, you know, we know that banks, for example, under Graham Leach Bliley are almost always going to be required to provide a copy of their privacy policy to consumers, and we still don't see great consumer engagement with it. And second to the right here, you know, does your provider's privacy policy allow it to give other companies access to personal data about you? So essentially we were trying to figure out if consumers, you know, what they did know about this. And you know, overwhelmingly, people either didn't know 
or they said no, you know, there was a lot of confusion here. And even among those who uh, said they had, you know, read most or all of their privacy policy, I think a full third still didn't know what it allowed. And relatedly here, you know, I think this really points to the need for a more privacy by, by default ecosystem. And so we ask consumers, would you like your provider to give other companies access to personal data about you so they can market products and services to you? I mentioned this before. Overwhelmingly, regardless of the type of entity that we're talking about here, consumers said no. Um, we also ask consumers, which of the following most closely describes your opinion? Um, that you know, we basically were trying to understand whether they preferred an opt-in or an opt-out standard. And overwhelmingly, again, regardless of the type of institution, consumers preferred an opt-in standard. So finally, I'll just end here. Um, I mentioned before that these results were very consistent across demographic groups. Um, I think maybe one of the more interesting ones for a variety, a variety of reasons is just that they were consistent um, by party ID. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, polarization in today's world, but we did find that this is one thing where Republicans, Democrats, and independents were really in lockstep on. So um, I would just encourage you to check out the report if you're interested in more information, and I'll end it there to make sure we have some time to chat. Daniel, thank you. Audience, please help me thank Ben, Sean, and Daniel for such great presentations. Now, audience, it's time for us to hear from you. It's time for us to move on to the question and answer segment. So I type in really fast and put those questions in. Nelson, do we have any questions for our audience? Yes, Linda, thank you. And yes, uh, please, please feel free to type in questions as, as we begin this Q&A session. Um, we do have a couple of questions related to safety, if we could maybe dig a little bit more, anyone who wants to touch on it. Um, you know, somebody says that, you know, based on what was said about Plaid today, they realize that that safety is important. Um, but their concern is the ability to retrieve, the ability of retrieval of the financial information submitted and received from a fintech, say over a cell phone, if there's a hack. Is that, how safe is that and what happens? Hi, this is Ben from Plaid. I just wanna make sure I understand the question that the, the uh, concern is over the device it, being a cell phone or where? Um, yeah, so the question is simply that if the what if there is a hack? You know, you're doing all this on your cell phone. If your cell phone is hacked, one, could there be information on the cell phone? But or, or um, is there another way that a hacker could get the information? So, well, I, I guess what I would say there, and, and you know, appreciate the emphasis, of course, on on safety. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that that came through. You know, I mentioned it's a responsibility of each individual company in the ecosystem to, to have their own strong security practices. And, and as any sort of licensed operating business that manages with, con with consumer data uh, or deals with consumer data on a regular basis, obviously needs to have their own privacy and security practices in place. What, what I would say is, you know, while every entity works hard to avoid such an outcome, um, there's you know similar steps can and should be taken if such an event does occur including you know if you notice um, unusual activity on any of your accounts you know the important thing would be to to close down those accounts and to reach out to the providers and, and make sure that it's uh ideally an issue that's that's uh, limited and, and has minimal impact to you um, so you know i i went through in in my presentation some of the steps that plaid takes in terms of encryption and maintaining a secure infrastructure, you know, to to eliminate a, a, at all odds the, the possibility of that happening. Uh, but of course, as is the case with with really any digital tools, you know, there are uh, bad actors out there who will will try to to cause other other individuals harm. And while the industry takes on full responsibility for avoiding those outcomes, um, consumers should should certainly be diligent. Uh, and, and vigilant as it relates to the safety and security of, of their accounts and, and be sure to communicate with all of the providers, including Plaid, if, if you, you know, we have our own consumer support uh, teams that we're happy, uh, you know, to provide that support to, to the millions of consumers that, that use our product. 
But so, so there shouldn't be too much concern about as financial data is being shared that there's anything on the device. Plaid data, data networks, fintechs aren't leaving information on the phones, right? That's correct. I would assume that for the most part, Plaid and uh, and I would imagine, I can't say with total certainty, but many of these products that have been developed are using cloud infrastructure and technology you know, in much the same way as traditional financial institutions do. Um, and so those services that tend to largely be outsourced from a data perspective in terms of storage, no, that data does not exist. You know, directly on your phone, it's being sent to you uh, via the Great, thank you. Um, similar, somebody's asking, how, how concerned can you be about when you hear things like the Robinhood hack that recently happened? It was I, understood to be, I guess, somewhat limited, but are those kinds of things going to continue happening? How concerned should we be about that as we are using more and more fin? So again, I'm, I'm happy to take that one, uh, Ben from Plaid here. Of course, every company operating in the space takes incredibly seriously the privacy and security of its consumers. Um, and when incidents like that happen, you know those companies will take whatever steps are required to keep that data secure. What I would say is, you know, there's there's not much that's necessarily specific to fintech with regards to, you know, greater exposure. Uh, to breaches or hacks, I, I think it's sort of an unfortunate factor of living most of our lives digitally now um, that this information does does exist um, online. And again, for for all the information that you could want about specifically how data networks keep your information secure, uh, please you know visit the websites that we referenced earlier. And I I have to imagine that many of those fintech applications have their own web pages that provide similar information. Hey, and this Sean, is the financial health network. Ahead, I'll just, oh, thank, thanks. I'll jump in there for one second. Um, you know, I, I do think that, you know, Ben's right that, you know, hacks are going to continue to happen broadly at different types of companies. And uh, that's probably not different in financial services than another other types of entities. But um, I think what is different and what consumers should be mindful of is just the monetary harm that could, for example, occur if their you know, account were to be hacked in some cases or uh, you know, uh, identity theft can have real implications for a consumer's credit. So, you know, consumers really should be re reviewing their statements with a fair amount of regularity to make sure that there's no unauthorized transactions. They should also be also be taking a bit, um, you know, taking the opportunity to review their credit report every year to make sure that there's nothing fishy on there, there's no inaccuracies. Um, I think from the financial perspective, those are really the, the two main things consumers should be on the lookout for. And was that Sean was going to add something, or yeah, um, I think Dan covered a lot of that. But just to just think of this at the at the Fed and particularly um, financial supervisors, think about lines of defense and just you know, like like I said and, and others on the call have said in their presentations, um, there are a lot of obligations on the business side, but there's a role for for every customer to play. I think that Robin Hood hack um, involved some some aspect of social engineering. And so that involves connectivity to a consumer using some sort of digital tool or a phone call, but it also involves them, you know, maybe um, sharing some sort of information. And so definitely being aware of that and just thinking about the different tools that they have. Um, the, you know, the earlier question on a cell phone vulnerability, um, you know, just also asking whether there's two-factor authentication that the consumer should be using. That that should always be the case with a financial institution, um, but just just being aware of these other tools and and the the individual's role as a line of defense. And related to this, if, if either because of a hack or unrelated to a hack, if there is unauthorized use, I know that there's some open questions and and Dan laid them out, but what is what is how are those uh, kind of complaints currently being resolved? Sorry, how are those complaints currently being resolved related there is to an unauthorized use because of a hack or unauthorized use for some other reason? Is um, do you go to your financial institution? Do you go to the fintech? How do those get resolved right now? 
Yeah. So typically I think in, in practice, the financial institution would be the one on the hook for it. And I think that's a big part of the question for why there's a need for regulatory clarity from the CFPB on this. Um, you know, financial institutions take the view that, or at least some do, take the view that, look, if there's uh, a data aggregator or a data network that's, um, you know, not... Uh, not really, you know, we're not really a party to any sort of arrangement with them and some sort of uh, something happens because of that, um, you know, we really shouldn't be on the hook for that. Um, and so, you know, our view on this is that the kind of clarity that we really need from a regulatory perspective is to make sure that at the very least consumers aren't on the hook um, just because of that lack of clarity issue. Um, and then beyond that, I think, you know, there's bilateral contracts between data aggregators and other others that work out some of those particularities too, but those can vary from party to party. Um, but one of the other panelists might have more insight on that. If not, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is about how data networks work, a little bit about just how they work. Uh, one, well, one is, um, is there a fee, for example, to use PLAID, at PLAID as was the the program that was discussed earlier, is there any kind of fee for Plaid Link or Plaid Portal? Uh, if not, how, how does Plaid make money? Great question. So no, there is not a fee to consumers to use these tools. Plaid is what's called the business to business company. So Plaid's customers are generally digital financial applications, a lot of FinTech companies, but also um, some financial institutions as well, some mortgage lenders, uh, essentially any company that operates today in the digital financial space will work with Plaid in order to compensate Plaid for providing the service of establishing those connections. So for example, when you download an application and go through the steps uh, that I had shared earlier of connecting your account to that application. Typically that application will, will compensate Plaid for um, establishing that connection. And then on a going forward basis, depending on your use of that application, uh, there tend to be some, some ongoing fees. So from a consumer perspective, uh, to the extent that some of these applications charge a monthly membership, um, you know, the, the case could be made that part of that compensation uh, as part of, you know, paying for the overall service, a portion of that service is uh, accounting for the, the fees that that uh, fintech company or financial institution are, are paying to plan. But no, the, today there are, there are no um, products that Plaid offers directly to consumers for which consumers pay a fee. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, somebody's asking if a fintech company shares my data with companies that are using algorithms what is their responsibility to make sure those algorithms are free from bias shouldn't the informa information information ecosystem promote more responsible practices system-wide to avoid potential discrimination we don't know anything about whether those companies have tested their algorithms for bias or not any thoughts from anyone Sure, I'm happy to start here, and but I imagine uh, Sean and Dan from from their policy perspectives also have some thoughts. You know, this this is a space that's very much developing, uh, not just in financial technology, but in technology at large, as it plays a larger role in our lives, is to to understand what are the inputs and the outputs of of those algorithms. Um, specific to the financial ecosystem, you know, in many cases, the types of data sharing and algorithms that are being used. Um, in fintech today, can be thought of a little bit in contrast, uh, especially when it comes to, to use cases like borrowing and lending, in contrast to traditional credit reporting, uh, where a lot of the data sharing takes place in the background with your financial institution, handing off packets of data about a consumer, you know, without the consumer's awareness to uh, a credit bureau. Uh, and, and many of those instances have, have equally been found, uh, you know, this might not be the most reassuring response, but but to carry those same forms of, of inherent bias into, into the algorithm. So, you know, we have a very strong new um, regulatory sort of oversight uh, and, and leadership coming in to, to both the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and the Federal Trade Commission, with, which have 
oversight over a lot of these issues. And, and there's also great interest. I think I saw a bill proposed from, uh, you know, in, in Congress just earlier today, trying to ban the use of algorithms on certain platforms. I don't know that that is necessarily an approach that has a lot of staying power, but you know, the, the, there are certainly interests across the ecosystem, especially from the provider side and making sure that the products and services that are used uh, that leverage this data ultimately can be more inclusive and better uh, in service of historically underserved populations. Thank you. I, yeah, so I would just say that entities using data do need to consider bias in their algorithms. Um, and for the flow of data, they need to consider accuracy of the data flowing from our financial institutions, Plaid, um, to Plaid, to FinTechs. Um, you know, there are challenges here um, in even measuring disparate impact. Um, these firms may not be collecting all of the information they need to be uh, adequately um, measuring their, their algorithms for disparate impact. They may be using other approaches to, to try to get to that. Um, but so there are data challenges here. Um, you know, we sometimes even hear from lenders who are uh, avoiding collecting certain data because they're, uh, uh, you know, they're afraid of uh, getting into trouble with things like fair lending. And so I, I just share that candidly because I think this is a, a very much a, a challenging issue and, and one where you know, more work needs to be done. But just as far as the use of um, AI, there's a pretty well-developed field within financial supervision around model risk management. And there's... Um, so, so thinking about um, the variables that are used in a variety of models that are used to make uh, either direct or indirect decision, uh, direct decisions around a financial service or some other indirect uh, decision that, that feeds into it. Um, and so there's a there's a pretty developed field there, but um, you know there is a lot more work that needs to be done specifically related to artificial intelligence and the regulation of it. Yeah, and I would just add that. I would just add that. That, you know that needs to, that work needs to be done both with respect to the models and AI and the use of different types of data. Um, really, are the you know really the, the work needs to be done on both ends. Um, Hundred percent agree. And yeah, I think this is an area where you know the disparate impact conversation is going to be evolving. But we we'll definitely also echo Ben's point. Just that unfortunately we see these types of activities occurring even without the use of AI. Um, and probably we'll you know hear more and more about those even uh, in the coming years as enforcement picks up. Um, um, but definitely this is an area that we need a lot more exploration because it's a really important problem. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, as, as we're talking about uh, APIs making it safer to share data, is there a recognized standard for FinTech APIs in the US? Is there a standard every, everybody will use? Hi, this is Ben from Plaid. So, while it's true that there are different types of APIs, and I mentioned in my presentation with 11,000 financial institutions, um, it's unlikely really ever that especially the smallest financial institutions will have the sort of technology budget that it might take to build an API. So Plaid, for an example, has um, an API specification that we have come up with that we share specifically with smaller financial institutions and have used um, in partnership with uh, core providers, which tend to be ten, uh, technology companies that that serve, you know, hundreds of uh, small credit unions at a time. At the same time, there is a an organization called the Financial Data Exchange, or FDX for short, uh, which is a, a nonprofit consortium where data networks like Plaid and our competitors will sit down with financial institutions to design an interoperable uh, API. Uh, which has uh, slowly started market adoption and hopefully will continue uh, to increase the, the proportion of uh, data connections that are taking. Uh, ben, I think uh, we're not hearing you right now. Any Anything to add by the other speakers? I'll move on to the next question. A uh, little bit about consumer rights. Uh, somebody's asking, I'll, I'll mention two of these questions. Maybe I think we can answer them together. If possible, the, the attendee asks, can a panelist share more information about existing consumer rights when, you know, when dealing with data aggregators? Uh, so a little bit more about consumer rights. And then here a question about a particular right. Is there a private remedy for Dodd, under Dodd-Frank uh, where consumer 
is entitled to their financial information from a financial institution? Um, what entities are covered by it? So how much right do we have to access our financial information uh, from financial institutions or fintechs, data aggregators? Any more on those rights? Sure, I can I can start with that one. So um, so yes, consumers are entitled to their access to their financial data under Dodd Frank Section 1033. Um, that's sort of the the crux of the statute, um, and, and and you know that that's the purpose of it is to make sure that consumers have that that right. Um, you know the scope of it isn't is is really covered persons. So essentially, entities that are covered by the CFPB uh, or Section 10 of the, the of Dodd Frank. Um, so really, that's all financial institutions within their purview, um, and I think actually beyond. And so there's, you know, there is a broad coverage there. There's been a little bit of um, back and forth about whether it's in effect, um, given that the statute is worded, you know, subject to regulations, um, you know, issued by the bureau. Um, I think, you know. Regardless of where you come down on that, uh, the bureau's rulemaking uh, will affirm that right uh, when and when and if that happens. And so, um, you know, that is that does exist. I, I didn't. I'm not sure if I heard. You know, I heard. Pri I wasn't sure if like if the person was asking about a private right of action related to that. Um, there isn't. Um, if that's what they were asking about, um, but I'll stop there to see if anybody else has anything to add. Yeah, I would just say that the uh, the data rights slide that uh, I put up there with the different tiers, um, I, I would say that there is nothing like that today um, in the U.S. regarding data aggregators or fintechs or or any other members of the of the ecosystem. Great, thank you. Um, then another question here. It's, it relates to access to uh, credit reports, but I mean, maybe in also if we could address it in terms of the data that's being collected, um, is there, where are we in terms of legislation or advocacy, they ask, uh, for getting better access to credit reports, credit scores, um, and not having to rely necessarily on apps to do that. Um, for example, they say, getting our weekly credit reports now for free is great. Um, and if that goes away, it's going to be a disappointment. But you know, to add to that, what about accessing the data um, that is being collected? Is it only when a, when a fintech or data aggregator is considered a, a CRA, a credit reporting uh, entity, or, or not? Does any know, anyone know about that? I'm not sure if I understood the latter part of the question, but uh, related to the ability to access credit reports, you can do that with annualcreditreport.com. As I mentioned, under FICRA, consumers are able to access uh, their their credit report once every 12 month period, free of charge. Um, so, you know, from that context, you should you shouldn't have to rely on an app to do that. Um, the second part, uh, you might need to repeat. Yeah, uh, no, it was just about you know the fact that we can get them. We have more access now, but that may be going away, and so that would be a disappointment. But um, moving on, we have another question here. Uh, really, they're asking you. Know, it gets a little bit confusing to find out where to learn about about you know what you need to know about this. What is what is it one go to site to understand how to access your data? when you have access to data, uh, where, to, where, to, where to learn what is being gathered. So hopefully some of the work that we've done with Consumer Action here can provide a lot of that information. The two fact sheets that were released earlier this week um, also include links to some of those pages that, uh, that Plaid uh, has on our own website. So. The Plaid information will be specific just to Plaid, and that's why we wanted to work with Consumer Action to put together materials that are more broadly applicable to the entire fintech ecosystem. So would certainly recommend visiting the fintech privacy website at the Consumer Action. Home. Great, and we will be providing those links. And then I think the last question, since we're running over time, people want, people are asking here about um, 
how much do fintechs profit from personal data that they collect and perhaps that they sell? If they profit a lot, would they ever permit consumers to have even more control of their own data? Do you get more control? Go ahead. I think it's hard to say right now. I'm not sure that there's a direct connection between the amount of control and the profits that fintech companies make. I would also say, you know, these companies are in the business of providing products and services, not of selling data. And so to the extent that they're successful and profitable would be a result of them having provided a good service to a consumer or a small business. In terms of providing greater control, that's really the, you know, what we hope will be some combination of policy efforts to come down from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as part of their Dodd Frank 1033 rulemaking, and also some of the private efforts that are underway, like the, the client portal dashboard that's accessible today. You know, I would say in terms of where's the best places to go to actually control that data, I do think it will be data networks like Plaid who will take it upon themselves to to uh, to be the the control panel um, for consumers and their data. So I can go next on this. Um, I would just kind of take it back to the question about what is the use of the data. So is it the primary use where it's necessary to deliver the specific product or service that the consumer is looking for from this provider, um, or is there is it fulfilling some other legal obligation? Um, that the provider has. Um, is it maybe more secondary? Is it potentially uh, improving that product um, and service for the broader set of customers? Um, and, you know, and, and so the consumer can at least understand that. But then it's the tertiary use. Is it something else? They're like an analytics product that this um, FinTech or data network is providing as another service that they're profiting from. Um, I think customers understanding that and then understanding is it really necessary for this level of data to, to just kind of get the product that I want or get that inter that connectivity between my fintech and my financial my traditional financial institution is it necessary and so I think once you start thinking of these uses of data in that way and then connecting it to these ideas of, of higher order rights depending on the use it starts to to make a little bit more sense. Now that's a lot to ask of a consumer, but I think for groups um, like those represented on this call that are, that are listening, and thank you so much for doing so, um, I think that can be a helpful way to start to educate um, and uh, educate your your consumers. Excellent, thank you, Sean. Uh, Linda, I'll turn it back to you. We are over time now. Thank you so much, panel. Great. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Ben, Sean, and Dan. Thank you for those fabulous presentations and hanging in there and answering all of our audience questions. You rock. Thank you so very much. Again, this webinar was presented with uh, funding from Plaid, and we want to thank Plaid uh, very much for this uh, great opportunity. Now on to the good stuff. If you enjoyed this webinar as much as you enjoyed your favorite latte, well, take the money for that latte, put it in a check, and mail it to us at Consumer Action Attention Membership Giving at 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, California. And another way that you can help us is by uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel. As I mentioned earlier, the webinar is being recorded and it will be placed on our YouTube channel. You can go and subscribe to, YouTube, to our YouTube channel. It is free and it would help us continue to bring the webinars that uh, we are bringing to you free. Again, a special thanks to our amazing speaker. Please, audience, join me in sending them the love. We appreciate them being here. And thanks to you, our fabulous audience. Thanks again for joining us today. Now, one last thing before we go. I notice that some of you haven't registered for our 12-2 webinar on housing insecurities. We still have a few slots available, but it's filling up. Now, if you're interested, send me an email. Hit me up at lynda.williams at consumer-action.org, and I will make sure that you get a VIP invite. I look forward to welcoming you back on December the 2nd. In the interim, please stay safe. Sean, Ben, Dan, thanks again. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.